to Destination Animation, your trip around the world of cartoons and anime, stop motion and puppetry, special effects and CGI, and everything in between. I'm your host, Becca Knott. And I am your host, Carrie Drebleau. And I'm your host, Jason Knott. And today, the boy's soul is mine. <laughs> Give us your soul. Soul. Souls. Did you bring the toll? <laughs> For the boys. You gotta pay the boys soul. Hole. Boys hole. Boys hole. <laughs> we're talking, we're gonna talk about Pixar's new movie, Soul, which came out like probably a month ago as of whenever this is gonna get posted. Yes. We're a little late, but that's okay. Holidays were busy. Yep, the movie, it came out on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. In the morning. Very early in the morning, 3 a.m. And I stayed up, I stayed up overnight that night to watch it the instant it released because it looked awesome. Well, aren't you dedicated? <laughs> I wonder if it was awesome. We'll have to talk about that, but... Before we do that, we have a lot of news to talk about because, what was it, December 10th, Disney had a big investor day and announced, like, 50 things. It's investor that, day. Investor day. They announced, All like, 50 things. All of it. And that's, like, just animation was, like, 50 things. There was, like, so much that they announced, but we're only talking about the animation. Yeah, there was, like, live action stuff. TV. Uh, TV, and then there was, like, sports crap that I don't care about. Yeah, some Nat Geo stuff. Yeah, all that boring real life stuff. Forget that. Animation. Animation. That's what we're here for. Um, So we're going to go through and just briefly talk about, like, every animated thing they announced. I've actually got the Twitter thread open here. They announced everything in a, in a convenient Twitter thread. So, let's begin. They talk about Raya and the Last Dragon coming to Disney Plus with Premiere Access on March 5th. I think that's going to be the same case as, like... Premiere Access. Mulan. God damn it. Yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're still planning on showing it in theaters, which... Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see that. Hopefully, you know, vaccines will be coming out and we'll slowly start being out of pandemic mode by then, maybe. Hopefully. I, I like that there's, like, the option, though, because obviously some locations are doing better than others. Um, yeah, so. yeah we might be able to see it in the theater, which would be nice because I've been, uh, as we're going to talk about when we get to our feature, I've really been missing seeing, you know, movies in theaters. Oh yeah, my gosh, me too. Yes. Well, I saw Wolf Walkers in theaters, so Ohio's theaters are open. It's just there's not much new stuff coming out. I'm a lucky. <laughs> um, okay, so the first kind of chunk of the announcements is uh, Star Wars. So Star Wars is like a quarter of everything Disney's doing right now. They're going all in with Star Wars, and that includes like, what is it, three animated shows. So what's the first one? The Bad Batch. The Bad Batch. Clone Wars. I mean, the Bad Batch. <laughs> um, yeah, apparently they showed up in season seven of the Clone Wars, but I'm only on like season three, so I don't know who they are. Uh, yeah, what I found was it was going to be a story arc in season seven, but then the show got canceled, so they weren't able to really go through with it. So now they're getting their own show, and it looks pretty neat. I like the style of it. It's like the same style as the Clone Wars, but a little grittier. I find. Yeah, definitely. Like, the way they had the camera during the trailer, you could tell, like, the, you know, these characters are supposed to be badass. Yeah. <laughs> um, starring D. Bradley Baker as everyone, because he plays all the clones. Hey. They all have the same voice. They're clones. Um, so there's a trailer for that. If you, I don't know, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the next uh, animated thing they announced was Star Wars Visions. Uh, which is going to be a series of short films created by, I think they're going to be disconnected, created by different anime creators. Anime, anime, woohoo! Amine, which immediately reminds me of Love, Death, and Robots, actually. Well, kind of. Kind of. Like, the way they had a different studio doing every episode. Or like the Animatrix is what I'm hoping. Ah, okay. I'm not familiar with the anime. I mean, I'm familiar with it, but I never watched it. Yeah, that was basically, the Wachowskis got a lot of anime creators to each do, like, a ten minute short based on the Matrix Because they're world. weebs. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> I never put together that it had to do with the Matrix. What? Really? Oh, okay. I'm, just, I'm, oh. I'm dumb. Oh, no. <laughs> but if it's, if it's like that, I will be very happy because, like, there are a lot of really good anime directors and studios who have very distinct styles. The Animatrix got Shinichiro Watanabe. I need to look at who Star Wars Visions actually gives. I don't know if they've actually announced it yet, though. No, they. I don't think so. They only just announced it. It is coming out this year, but I don't know if there's been any other <coughs> news. Yeah, I'm looking at all of the uh, information on it, and it does not appear to list any actual studios or, like, directors, so, yeah. We'll have to wait and see. Well, I'm looking forward to it anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, and then the last animated thing, like I said, Star Wars took up like a quarter of this investor meeting, but only three of the things were animated, so that's all we're talking about, is, um, what's it called? Star Wars A Droid Story, which is going to be a team up between Lucasfilm with Industrial Light and Magic doing the animation, and it's going to be about R2 and 3PO guiding a new character on some adventures, and that that one's a feature. Ray P.O. <laughs> Ray P.O. 3PO! Uh, 3PO! <laughs> Where could he be? Uh... <laughs> That's interesting, because I think uh, Lucasfilm, Luca- Industrial Light, and Magic, their last movie was uh, Strange Magic. So, Oh, no! So, like, ho- hopefully uh, with Star Wars, they do better. <laughs> ILM is, like, the visual effects department, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. yeah, of Lucasfilm's kind of. Cool. Yeah, well, we talk about how live-action films, like, live-action, quote, is more becoming like animation. We've yeah. had this discussion a lot, but if we're being honest, like, Lucas, like, Industrial Light and Magic might as well be an animation studio. It's just that That's they true. try to make things more photorealistic. Yeah, definitely. Well, I don't know. Pix- Pixar's been doing a pretty good job of making things photorealistic, but <laughs> it depends. Star Wars, though, like, I guess the difference between visual effects is it still features actors and sets to a degree, you know? Yeah. Yes. So. But I, I do agree, a lot of stuff is animated these days. Yeah. And I just remembered, I forgot, um, we didn't talk about this last time, there was a Star Wars holiday special. Lego Star Wars holiday special. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you watched it, Carrie. I didn't have it on the list because I literally just remembered it. Um, it was very cute. It kind of retconned episode nine, which Jason was It in. didn't talk about it at all, which was like, okay, <laughs> um, I like this. <laughs> We're not going to get into Star Wars drama, but... But episode nine sucks. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, but it was very good. New Christmas uh, staple, I think. Yeah. I'll so, watch it every life day. Is this the episode that we officially became a Star Wars podcast? Because there's actually No, Star because Wars we're animation. moving on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I guess they're doing a Turner and Hooch movie starring Josh Peck. That's a thing. Um, <laughs> the next thing you have listed on the list is uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Yeah, there's no info on that, but there's um, just a new Diary of a Wimpy Kid animated movie. Oh, wait, out. it's live action. Oh, wait, the live... Oh, never mind, never mind. It said the live-action film franchise, yada, 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 as an all-new animated film, which yeah. they should have done in the beginning, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. I I imagine it's probably going to be, like, the illustrations. Yeah, I would yeah. imagine. The books have a very distinct visual style, like, which it's really hard to come across in live-action, but it's a very, very minimalistic drawing style. Yeah, yeah it's just like if a kid was drawing him. And that's going to go straight to Disney Plus, which a lot of what we're going to talk about here is going straight to Disney Plus. Oh, yeah. Disney Plus is like pulling out all the stops on going all in on features and series. And like, it's kind of like Disney has decided this is our new frontier. This is where new stuff is coming out. Which I'm in favor Uh... of, personally, somewhat. I would like to still see features in theaters, but I like not having to fuss around with like TV channels. And it's all on my streaming service. I hate the streaming wars. We've talked about that before i wish everything would kind of unify under maybe three or four at most but you know it is what it is you say that but then the monkey's paw will uh curl curl a finger and disney will buy more companies so oh no that's true well you know what mr crab said the money is always right and he is right the ceiling's right the next announcement now this is this kind of funny it's a ice age tv series the adventures of buck wild buck wild buck wild he was that uh, that lovable character who from that movie i didn't see yeah uh he was played by simon Pegg. you like simon Pegg? i do like simon Pegg. he's that weasel with an eye patch does disney actually own the ice age franchise now yeah they they own blue sky yeah oh they bought blue sky a little while ago because 20th century fox you know yeah Uh, okay it came with fox so yeah ice age belongs to disney now so they're Hosting this new series that's coming out. <laughs> yeah, yet be there wasn't enough Ice Age in the world already. Yeah, I like the first. The first Ice one's Age. a good movie, but I mean, yeah, it's just one of those franchises that's like, oh, you should have stopped at one. Now, are we? <laughs> yeah, that's coming out in 2022. Um, next is uh, Night at the Museum animated series that's coming to Disney. No, it's a. No, wait, where CGI am I? CGI feature. It is a feature. Sorry, my bad. I'm getting confused between my notes. Uh, yeah, that's a feature. Um, I saw the first night at the museum, and I think the only reason it matters is, wasn't that the movie that the Goofy short was in front of? I don't remember. I didn't see it in theaters. Yes, <laughs> okay. I believe so. It was what home, how to hook up your home theater. Or wait, no, I think it might have been National Treasure 2 or something. Yeah, because... Oh. I gotta Google that. Hang on. The first night at the museum was... 20th Century Fox. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. You're right. I guess, um, well... 
did have Dick Van Dyke, though. Yes. And Mickey Rooney. Night at the museum. I don't really care. Unless, unless. Unless. Uh, the cowboy and the gladiator are boyfriends. Okay, yeah. The goofy short was in front of National Treasure Book of Secrets, not uh, Night at the Museum, too. Book, book of Secrets. <laughs> My be. We're just going to gloss right over this one. A prequel to the quote-unquote live-action live Skip it. Come on, skip it. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> the full cast of the uh, live-action Little Mermaid um, was announced. Uh, we already knew, what's see, Halle ba- Bailey is playing, not Halle Berry, Halle Bailey is playing What if Halle Berry was playing her mom? Whoa. Mm. <laughs> uh, she, she's Ariel. That was announced a while ago, much to the rage of the internet. because you The know, rage racism. and the celebration of the internet. Like, oh god, I was loving the fan art that people yeah. were doing. Ugh, that was... That was fun, even though, like, the backlash was predictable. Yeah, I mean, there was really two camps on that casting announcement, and the one you fell into really depended on whether or not you're a racist. (laughs) Um, So some other cool cast members, they've got David Diggs from, uh, he was in Hamilton as Sebastian, Melissa McCarthy as Ursula. Don't people not like her? I don't know. She was in Ghostbusters, the Uh, the reboot, so people don't like that movie for reasons. uh, Some valid, some not, but... (laughs) I mean... Ursula is, like, one of my favorite Disney villains, um, and that casting doesn't, like, wow me, but I'm gonna, I mean, I'm not gonna judge And, uh, Ursula. Javier Bardem, Masking Triton. Oh, lord. Who's Javier Bardem? Anton Chigurh. What business is it, is it of yours, what I do with my daughter? Crabbo. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> Scuttle I can't is, call it for you. <laughs> Scuttle is gonna be played by Aquafina. Aquafina. Not Sextina Aquafina from Bojack Horseman, right? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's no. always what I think of. <laughs> Next announcement is a live action animated hybrid adaptation of <coughs> Chippendale Rescue Rangers. And this is going to be a feature. Um, it's going to have John Mulaney as Chip, Adam, Andy Samberg as Dale, which that sounds great. On the other hand, it sounds like the Chipmunks movies. I yeah, hope not. it sounds like uh, G Force. I really hope not. I, I don't know about this one. Like, they kind of got me in the first half with the casting, but we'll have to wait and see. That's, uh, when's that one coming out? 2022. It's directed by Akiva Schaefer, who is, like, the third member of The Lonely Island. Oh, nice. I said that as if John Mulaney is part of The Lonely Island. He's (laughs) He's not. He's one of the three members of The Lonely Island, so, uh, we'll see. I'm trying not to be too negative, but I'm just kind of over all of this, like, reboots of 80s and 90s nostalgia properties. So the next thing on the list is Pinocchio, which from is from the forties. From the forties, so it doesn't count. <laughs> yes, it first came out on VHS in the eighties and nineties. So fight me. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, yeah, this is not the Guillermo del Toro version. So I don't care. <laughs> it's the Robert Zemeckis version. Now I thought he was fired from every making a movie again for, by all of Hollywood. Well, he didn't technically make Mars Needs Moms. He just produced it. So oh, I forgot to mention uh, back. At Little Mermaid, uh, I had the note, the music's going to be by Alan Menken and Lin-Manuel Miranda, which sounds like an amazing team up, so I'm looking forward oh, yeah. to that. Yeah, I was bummed that we skipped over that, because, like, I'm assuming what they're doing is that they're adding a couple of new songs, like they do with pretty much all of these live-action remakes of the musical Disney animated movies. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. it won't be bullshit like the fl- frickin' I Won't Be Silent song from Aladdin. <laughs> Spirit <laughs> And then, yeah. well, I mean, it's a fine song, but whatever. Yeah, but that's that's a good T bump. I mean, if we can't have Howard Ashman, we can have Lin Manuel Miranda, and Alan Menken's a legend. Heck yeah, and Alan Menken. Yeah, and yeah. if you can't get T S Eliot, you get T S. We're not a cat's podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, so sorry for jumping ahead, but like back to Pinocchio real quick. Uh, Robert Pinocchio. Zemeckis is directing. Tom Hanks is going to play Geppetto, so I guess it's going to be like a weird version How of Polar Express. I'm um, Geppetto. <laughs> Yeah, is this going to be mocap? Like, has that? I looked and I couldn't see confirmation anywhere. All we got was a info. teaser trailer. I would imagine that. I would imagine that Pinocchio would be mocapped. But I wouldn't put it put put it past them to make the whole thing mocap. I don't know. I don't think they're they'd really want to try that again. Now you know what? I here's my argument in favor. Uh, remember the Tintin movie. Well, yeah, but like, let me make, let t- me make my point. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> um, they that ended up being all mocap, and one of the reasons they said was so that Snowy, the dog character, would look natural. Now this movie has a cat character, Figaro, so maybe maybe, maybe. they're going to use the same justification. Figaro and yeah, it wouldn't needs be a- to be cute. It's a requirement. Yes. Figaro is a and precious I be little a- dumpling, and I will protect. And I wouldn't be opposed to it, but it's just that like. Uh, the last time they did a mocap movie was Mars and Eve's Moms, and it was 
a terrible box office bomb, so I don't know if they'd really go for it again. Well, this is coming, I think this one's going straight to Disney Plus, so. Oh, well then, all right. (laughs) Pretty much everything's going straight to Disney Plus. That makes me think it's probably not going to be mocap, because mocap is ridiculously expensive, like. That is true, that is true. Yeah. Not that regular animation is much cheaper, anyway. Something that was kind of funny while I was just researching everything here was, like, literally, like, the day before this big investor meeting another studio put out their trailer for a pinocchio movie oops no what, one's gonna see that? that i don't even it's know it's not the del toro version right? it's not the del toro version it was just something else is like a european it just i just thought it was a funny uh, probably question. italian so there's italian. like three pinocchio adaptations coming out in the next few years yep yeah i think i heard about the italian one it was well it's not animated so who cares <laughs> yeah now, the teaser trailer did use, like, the original, like, it basically just used CG versions of the original character models. Like, Pinocchio and Geppetto looked exactly like the version in the 1940 movie. Yeah, I think it's just concept art. I think there's a good chance that the visual style might change somewhat. Yep, valid. The next thing, and this one, it took me a minute to figure out if this was going to be live action or animated because they didn't actually say it in the tweet, but it's the Peter Pan and Wendy movie, which as far as I can tell is animated. And even if it's not, I guess we still got to talk about live action remakes of Disney movies. When they released, when Warner Brothers made Pan, (laughs) I predicted that it was only a matter of time before Disney remade Peter Pan themselves. And here it is. (laughs) Uh, Jude Law is going to play Captain Hook. No, yeah. he's like the only All right. cast member I really recommend. What? No Christopher cool. Walken revising his role? <laughs> <laughs> Spirit wants this dark lagoon tonight. Peter Pan has found a mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a sequel to Enchanted coming, which is uh, weird because Enchanted is not on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, what the hell? It isn't? It's weird. Put it on. What, what's wrong with you? It's not in Canada, anyway. Um, we are missing a few things. I'm curious. America's- Hang on a sec. Yeah, Carrie's going to check. So this is a it's a sequel. It's called Disenchanted. Amy Adams, James Marston, Patrick Dempsey are all reprising their roles. Um, Amy Adams is my wife, so I'm really <laughs> glad about that. It's set ten years later. Uh, when, the fir- cool. when did the first movie come out? 2007. Uh, that's yep. what I thought, yeah. That was when I wrote my first article for the school newspaper about how Disney, w- about the incoming Disney second renaissance... And, and, oh, you were right. You called it. Hell yeah! Holy smokes! Enchanted isn't Enchanted isn't on Disney Plus. What the what the what the fudge? That it's really weird. So next, they have some uh, screen caps of characters from Raya and the Last Dragon, which is coming out in March. We actually have a look at the dragon now, and I was saying a lot like people were hating on the dragon design. And I said I was going to wait to see it. Uh, now that I see it. I'll have to see her in motion. It's really hard to judge animation by a still frame, yes. obviously. Yeah, th- that's where we got that issue with, like, people hated Rapunzel's design when it was first spoiled, and then they saw her in motion, and all of a sudden, like, everybody fell in love with her. She's fine. <laughs> she and is fine. fine. Anyway. <laughs> yes. No, I remember the first screen caps of her were really awkward. Yeah. Um, and this dragon, I don't know about... Mm, not, not. Aquafina is this dragon as well, right? Yes. And Scuttle. I think the concept is cute. Like, I like the body. I like the fins. The face isn't quite doing it for me. But again, uh, gotta see it in motion. And I'm just talking about this because I think I said in the last episode that I was waiting for a screen cap of this character. Um, what do you guys think? I think that guy looks like Sean Yu. This guy does look like Sean Yu, kind of. I do like the color palette of the dragon. Um, I will say it wouldn't be my first design choice, but, well, I don't know. We'll see. Some, something about the face isn't doing it for me, but, like, I will say again, I, I gotta wait to see it in motion. Um, the next thing on the list was they, they announced four new shows that are spinoffs of some of their movies. Uh, first is Baymax, which is gonna be, a, like, Big Hero 6 already has a TV series, so this is gonna be a spinoff of that about Baymax's day job as a nurse. Oh. That's adorable. <laughs> I'm for that. Yeah, Baymax was probably the best part of Big Hero 6, so I'm for it. Everyone loves Baymax. Yeah. Uh, Zootopia Plus, which is not coming till 2022, so there's not much info, but it seems like it's going to be an anthology series about some of the side characters. No! <laughs> no. I want, I want Judy and, and Nick. You want your police procedure. I want them to get together. <laughs> yeah. No, get out of here. No, nah, um... Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's going to be an anthology series, so we'll we'll see. Yeah, quickly, Zootopia is like a series that invites a lot of a lot more exploration into its world. So I think there's a lot of space for them to go with that. Yeah, definitely. I can agree yeah, with that. Yeah. Next is Tiana, 
which is going to be a long-form musical comedy series. Oh, neat. So I wonder if they're taking a page out of the Tangled the Series book with this and the next one that we're going to say. But uh, obviously this is based on Princess and the Frog. I hope it takes inspiration from Tangled the Series. That was good. Well, the intro movie that I saw. <laughs> yeah, the, not in the sense that they keep turning Tiana into like a frog or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, hopefully they don't do that. The, uh, these shows aren't coming out till like 2022 and the next one... Not till 2023. Next one is Moana. So she's getting her own Moana. series as well. Also a long form musical series. So I, I'm i I'm eager to see those last two, Tiana and Moana, because Tangled was very, very good. Listeners, if you have not watched the Tangled series or Rapunzel's Tangled event, what did they end up calling it? Uh, Tangled. This, uh, Rapun- it went through like a <laughs> couple of titles, weirdly. Um, the Rapunzel Show, which is what I'm going to call it from now on, but... Uh, yeah, if they take a page from that show's book, um, I think we are in good shape. I'm pretty excited for um, Tiana just because like, I feel like that character did not get enough love from Disney. Uh, Moana I'm a little less sure about because I feel like I don't know how much material was left after the movie to explore, but I don't know. I mean, you could argue that for like Tangled too. And yeah. They ended up doing a lot with it. Yeah. Moana will be like uh, Wind Waker and she'll just sail around a bunch of islands. Yeah, oh, that's actually, probably that going to be the setup, you know? Oh, that, yeah. that actually makes sense now that I think about it. Yeah, never mind. Okay, there there is material there. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, Tiana is a great character. Oh, 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 oh. What? Lottie. Lottie? I Yay. love her. Yes. I, I forgot. She's, I love her. Uh, so she's coming back. You gotta bring me some more of those man-catching beignets. No Keith David, though, because he's dead. What? Oh, Dr. No, Facilier uh, no, is yeah, dead. Dr. Facilier I is thought dead. you just dropped a bomb on me. I was upset. No, he's Don't alive. Don't say Keith, that. Keith David is alive. Okay. His character is dead. But he's he gonna, might. He's going to die tomorrow now because of you. No. <laughs> the next thing um, is Iwaju, which is a series on Disney+. Plus. It's a collab with a pan-African company called Kugali. Yeah. Based in futuristic Lagos, Nigeria, the series will explore class innocence and challenging the status quo. It looks fucking cool if I may have an F-bomb. This <laughs> I am excited for. Yeah, I they got one piece of concept art. It looks really cool. Like it's it's kind of like Wakanda ish. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, yeah, Afro futurism. Af- Afro futurism. Yeah, I really like the buildings. Like they look like traditional statues, and like what is that? What is that? And the colors look really nice. I hope I hope the the show proper has a nice palette like that. Yes. Yeah, like I can only get so excited about Disney just continuing to milk their franchises, but this is like a new thing where they're like mm. moving into new story territory, you know, like collaborating with a studio from a different uh it just excites me. I get excited for new things. Oh, definitely. Oh yeah. Speaking of, I only get excited for the 75th Marvel movie that comes out this year. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh speaking of original the next Disney feature after Ryan the Last Dragon is Encanto, it's called? Is that yes. Right? Yeah, I think so. Encanto. 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 That's, it's going to be Disney's 60th feature. Has Whoa. it been 10 movies since Tangled? Yeah, I guess it Apparently. has. Yeah. Oh, damn. It's going to be directed by Byron Howard of Tangled and Jared Bush, who co-directed Zootopia and did the screenplay for Moana. Uh, music by Lin-Manuel Miranda. He just does the music for Yay! everything now. It's going to take place in Colombia, where a magical family lives in a magical home, is the premise. Carrie's quite excited for this one. Seriously, I am so excited, not only to just have music back as a Disney staple, like good music, Mm. like having Lin-Manuel Miranda and Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez. It's like, oh, good musical, like Broadway songwriters back into Disney movies. I love it. Definitely, definitely. Get out of here, Phil Collins. (laughs) Oh, no, I love you, Phil Collins. I like the Phil Collins scores bite me. Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's, I'll, it's okay. I'll be the one that hates on Phil Collins on this podcast. <laughs> it's always the same. It's just the... Sh- Wait, I got... Um, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. Um, I was saying the other day, me and Jason were talking about... Because I've been watching Hamilton like 20 times a day. <laughs> and I was saying how like Lin-Manuel Miranda to me feels like the modern Howard Ashman in his ly- lyrical prowess. Yes. Um, so I'm all for him doing all the music. I'm fine with that. Yeah. And also, like, even though I was meh on Tangled 2, the story was a bit clunky. The music is, like, still god-tier great. It's Tangled 2. I, er, I keep saying Tangled 2. I mean Frozen 2. <laughs> oh, Frozen 2. Yeah, and if Tangled 2 had a, was a thing. <laughs> I, I made the same mistake when I was explaining this to Steph. I don't know why my brain says Tangled 2. No, Frozen 2. Music, God's here. I know why. 
I know why it is. It's because Disney uses the same character design for all their female characters. Hot take. Next oh! uh, category is... Category. What is this? A game show? I didn't get to talk about Encanto except for the music, though. Like, oh, yeah. Go ahead. The color palette reminds me a lot of Disney's Latin American good neighbor films from the 1940s. Like, Ooh. it reminded me of the Bahia segment from yeah. uh, Saludos Amigos and the Three Caballeros. Ugh. I'm all for it. It looks great. We've only seen concept art, but I, I'm just in love with the color palette and the visual design and the mood. I'm a mood watcher. Yeah. Uh, this movie's coming out in November. It complete. I had no idea this was coming out. It completely snuck up on me. Yes. Um, which is weird, because we're usually on top of that sort of thing. How dare we? Also, Byron Howard's a great director. Anyway. Yes. yes. Um, so next uh, little segment is everything announced for Pixar. First up, a reminder that their latest film, Pixar Soul, is premiering only on Disney Plus this Christmas. Oops, we're late. So... Yes, and it's about 30 minutes into the episode. <laughs> okay, well, we'll try to pick up the pace. We got a lot of news. This is all the news. Yeah. There was a new Spark short announced here, Burrow, which we will talk about when we talk about Soul as well, because it's... Well, we'll talk about why. So, Popcorn. Popcorn is a series of little shorts that's going to star characters from... Pixar movies, huh. um, which reminds me of like Mike's new car and like little shorts like that. Yeah. Um. So that's cool. I'm fine yeah. with that. And also like the little Toy Story tunes that used to pop up in front of some movies, like uh, yeah, the one with the like McDonald's action figure version of the Toy Story character still kills me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That's literally starting next week. So oh, nice. We got January twenty second is the release date. I don't know when the podcast episode is going to come out, but as of this recording, it's coming out very soon. Next is Doug Days, which is about Doug from Up and Carl Fredrickson living in suburbia and his little doggy adventures. That's cute. Um, yep, could be cute. And like I said before, like pretty much everything we're talking about here except for features is coming to Disney+. Plus. There's a car series coming to Disney+, Plus. who cares? Yay! <laughs> so this one's pretty interesting. Uh, in fall 2023 is Win or Lose, which is the first long-form original series by Pixar. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and the premise is the show follows a middle school softball team in the week leading up to their championship game. And each episode is told from the perspective of a different character. That's pretty neat. Yeah, that, sounds that sounds pretty cool. cool. I know that um, somebody said that the inspiration was like Rashomon, the famous Akira Kurosawa <laughs> Japanese film. where <laughs> There's a gag in The Simpsons where I forget where it's coming from, but Marge says to Homer, like, you liked Rashomon, though. And he's like, that's not how I remember it. <laughs> I understand that joke. <laughs> I've never seen the movie, but I get it. That's funny. The next Pixar theatrical film is Luca, coming out June 18th. Set in Italy, coming-of-age story about a boy and his, I assume, boyfriend. <laughs> they better be boyfriends. So he meets, like, a friend in town who turns out he's a sea monster. What? What's that oh, about? a Selkie? Okay. Uh, maybe a Selkie. Yeah, all right. Oh, this is Pixar Presents Song of the Sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. Then, maybe then it will get the Oscar. Anyway. Then their next feature, which is March of 2022, is Turning Red, which is, <gasps> uh, which is about, uh, it's going to be Pixar's 25th oh, theatrical nice. feature. Ooh. Big milestone for them. Directed by Domi Shi, who directed the short film Bao, which was in front of Incredibles 2. Yay! And it's about a 13-year-old girl who, whenever she has, like, strong emotions or gets excited, she poof and turns into a giant red panda. Oh. Jason loves red pandas. I love red pandas, and it's a week. It's coming out a week after my birthday. It was made for me. Yes, what a gift. Uh, like five original Walt Disney Animation Studios and Pixar Animation Studios films, not sequels, not spinoffs, in like yes. 14 months. My cup runneth over, Disney. We, mm -hmm. we have had such a drought of original content. It was all sequels for a hot minute there. So yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Um, this is cool. Especially because Soul is so damn good. Hopefully the other ones are as good as Soul. Yeah. yeah. Throwing a wrench into that, uh, in June of 2022 is Lightyear, which is like a spinoff of Toy Story. It's it's basically like in universe of Toy Story, the toy buzz is based on this show, which they're making a movie of, I guess. But that already exists. They had a TV show, Buzz yeah. Lightyear, The Adventures of Star Command. Put it on Disney yeah. Plus, you cowards. How is this different from Buzz Lightyear of Star Command? I don't know. Well, Chris Evans plays Buzz. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's the difference. Not Patrick Warburton. Patrick Warburton? Yeah, he played him on they the show. They didn't get Tim Allen for Buzz in the series? Well, they had him in, like, the pilot movie. Okay. But then uh, for this, but then it's Tim Allen. He's, like, a busy guy and an asshole, so. Yeah. Um, the first image of this released and everyone was like, what the, what the heck is this? Because it looks, like, really, like, edgy, but it's Buzz. It's kind of hilarious. It even seemed like Chris Evans was, like, 
caught off guard like oh this is a thing <laughs> yeah there was an interview with pete doctor where they said like they basically make sequels to fuel their original content habit the sequels keep the lights on yeah All right, fair enough fair enough um and then they did another like oh no i got marvel and star wars confused um then the next section of the investor meeting was uh marvel there's a lot of marvel shows coming out only one of them is animated, which is Marvel What If, which we have a nice big trailer for. It's coming in the summer of this year. It is what it sounds like. It's What If. It's alternate realities, interpretations of certain Marvel stories. Yeah, what if Peggy Carter got the super soldier serum instead of uh, Steve Rogers? What if T'Challa went up into space instead of uh, Star-Lord? What's his name? <laughs> got, got adopted by Yondu. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It looks cool. I like the style. Yeah. The animation style looks I like the premise. Yeah. Carrie is not super familiar with Marvel, unfortunately. But we've, me and Jason have seen all the movies. And I saw the original Avengers once. That's, and I I saw Black Panther. That's it. Yeah. Um, I think the premise is a really, really cool idea. So I'm looking forward to it. I don't know. Does Into the Spider Verse count as Marvel content, even though it's Sony? Well, yeah, it's Sony, so it doesn't. Yeah. Really, it doesn't well, yeah, it doesn't tie into like the whole the MCU. Yeah, it doesn't tie into which the... may be doing their own Spider Verse story, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yes, and that's pretty much it. Like I said, Disney announced about two hundred things. Like they announced She Hulk, Hawkeye, Moon Moon Knight, Secret Moon Knight. <laughs> Moon Knight. They announced everything, but we're only talking. We're only here for cartoons. No. Yeah, the style does look cool, even as somebody who has no clue what's going on in the story. Like it's this, it's like this two point five D animation where it's three D, but it also has lines. Yeah, which is something that we're going to see in Soul, but we're not quite there yet because there's some non Disney cartoons we want to mention too. We neglected to mention in the last episode, but Tuca and Birdie season two is coming. Yay! It was. Netflix canceled Tuca and Birdie, a tragedy. Because they're cowards. Which is weird, because Netflix doesn't cancel anything. Except for Dark Crystal. That's true! Why do they cancel all the good Because they suck. They do suck. Uh, but Adult Swim uh, swooped in and rescued Tuca and Birdie, renewed them for season two. Uh, hopefully being on, like, a network doesn't mean it's gonna be too restricted. Yeah. We'll have to see, but I'm, I'm just glad that it's coming back, because yeah. we love Tuca and Birdie. One of the things that made that show so unique was like the, I don't know, there's something about the story handling and the pacing and all that that made it feel very different. I hope they don't lose that unique feel to appeal to like a broadcast audience. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the only thing, but I mean, between having it on a network and not having it at all, I mean, I'll take it on the network. Yeah, you know? definitely. The next little thing was uh, we were watching the Game Awards, my husband and I, and after, something we rarely do. <laughs> and after Sephiroth killed Mario, they dropped the trailer <laughs> for Ark, which is a show based on it's an MMO, I think. I'm not super. I have familiar. no idea what it is. I just know that Vin Diesel's in the game. Yeah, I'm not super duper familiar with the game. I think it's like an MMO that takes place in dinosaur times, but with like some futuristic stuff. Oh yeah, you're right. It is a weird MMO thing. They had a monster. They had a Monster Factory Yeah, about Monster it. Factory about it. Um, uh, the trailer looks really cool. The main character looks like Korra from Legend of Korra, riding on a Parasaurolophus. Oh, yeah. And the animation looks tasty. It mm. kind of reminds me of Castlevania in its style and its clout, because it's got a lot of... Who were some of the voice actors? I'm just hoping it'll have a captivating story and characters like uh, Dragon Prince or something like that. Like, Netflix is still just pulling out all the stops on their big animated series. Yeah, as someone who knows nothing about Ark, it looked really cool that, like, she was fighting, like, this medieval knight who was riding on some kind of Utah raptor or something, and it was cool. And You're just dropping all the, the dinosaur I don't know effects. if it was a Utah raptor. <laughs> That's... It probably wasn't. A, U- a raptor from Utah. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, they have like who who's who do they have? Like they have Elliot Page, Malcolm McDowell, David uh, Tennant, David Tennant, Gerard Diesel, Butler, Gerard Butler. They what have an acting clout! My goodness. Yeah, let's see if it translates to voice acting. Oh yeah, and Russell Crowe, I remember Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. <laughs> uh, next quick bit of news: uh, Green Eggs and Ham, the second serving. So we already knew this was getting a second season. I think it was like confirmed like not long after season one aired, but. It's got a title. It's going to be called The Second Serving. It's going to be 10 episodes. We have that confirmed. I th- what was the first season? Was it 13? Yeah. It was fairly long. Yeah. I feel like they could have trimmed down a lot of the episodes, but whatever. I mean, that being said, um, for a book that has maybe 10 different words, they 
It was a really good show, actually. Yeah, it was. Um, have you watched it yet, Carrie? I have seen like the first five or six episodes, and I was like, this is way better than it has any right to be. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I think it's the most expensive show Netflix has ever done. And it shows like yeah. when you know how much animation costs. It's it's gorgeous, actually. <laughs> Like, it's so pretty. It's, like, fully detailed 2D animation. Like, I mean, they just went all out on the 2D animation on that. Yeah, for sure. Oh, shoot, we forgot to watch this. Um, Because the next thing on the list is there's a Netflix short called Cam- Canvas, which uh, maybe we'll save that maybe for the next episode. I have seen it. Oh. Yeah, what well, is that about? Talk about it. <laughs> okay, so basically Canvas is about, is about a old grandpa character who apparently used to be a painter and, but now in his old age has kind of stopped doing it for reasons that the short explores and um, his grandchild uh-huh. comes to visit him and I won't spoil it. Okay. Okay. Well, well, we'll probably watch it. Uh, well, we're going to forget by the time we're done recording this, but we'll watch it at some point. But also like black representation. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, knowing nothing about this short, it kind of reminds me of uh, Hair Love when that was coming out. Yeah. Just kind of the buzz around it. It is It is very Pixarian style, that's what I will say. Ooh. And then the last thing I have on the list uh, coming out this fall is Dead Endia to Netflix, which is a series that's based on a graphic novel. And the premise is the series follows a group of employees who work at a theme park haunted house during the summer, which might be a portal to hell. Ooh. Ooh. Um, not a lot of info on that yet. So. I'm just blown away at all this stuff that's coming out. And like, I'm legitimately excited for a good chunk of it. Like, gosh, how do we get to this point where there's so much animation coming out? And it's like, ah, uh, it's good. I know. It is. Speaking of hell, I just remembered there's been a couple of episodes of Hell of a Boss on YouTube. If our listeners remember, that is another show by uh, Vivzy Pop. Vivzy Pop in her studio. Uh, they're the ones who did Has Been Hotel. They also did... A hell of a boss. They posted the pilot not long after Has Been Hotel, I think. Um, yeah. And now there's been a couple episodes of the show proper. It's a uh, YouTube original, I guess we'll call it. Yes. They had, what's her name in the first episode? Mara Wilson. They had Mara Wilson. And uh, Jinx Monsoon, I th- is that her name? Yeah. Yeah. Mara, get rid of the Nazis, Wilson, according to her Twitter handle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was the other thing? Oh, Long Gone Gulch, which is another YouTube show. That, that dropped recently, didn't it? That that did drop like last week. We haven't watched it yet, but that's another. I I think YouTube originals are cool. Yeah, they are because that's complete freedom, right? Yeah, those are all like passion projects of the people who want to make them. Absolutely, we've been watching a lot of Worthy Kids animation. Um, oh, I never talked about Big Top Burger, which is my favorite thing <laughs> of all time. It, <laughs> it's um all five episodes form maybe ten minutes of show, but. Yes, it's great. So good. But let us move on. Yes. There is 47 minutes of stuff to edit for me. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Let's get We're to... sorry, Jason. It's so it's much sorry. news. Well, maybe we, it may be if we did our episodes more often, there wouldn't be so much to talk about. Maybe. Hey. Huh. Us. Us. If it ain't the consequences of our actions. Yeah. Take that, mm-hmm. us. Yeah. So, listeners, typically in front of a Pixar movie, there is a short. Was, was it in one? front of Onward? No, yeah, reason? there was. I was about to ask. Yeah, that was weird. They've actually skipped shorts a few times over the past few years. Hmm. Yeah, they've been shirking. Yeah. So Pixar also has a program like through Disney Plus, and it started on YouTube, and now it's on Disney Plus, called Spark Shorts, where they let some of their employees test the waters making their own shorts. So this new short, Burrow, is labeled as a Spark Short, but I guarantee it was meant to be, you know, attached to Soul, because why not? You yes. Know? But now it's a spark short, and that's fine. What's it about? It's about a little bunny. It is about cute and cute and cute and cute. It's so cute. Yeah, it's a little bunny trying to make her dream home. Yeah. It's called Burrow because she digs underground, and she encounters, like, all the other undergroundlings, like moles and uh, lizards and rats. And, and a badger. And a badger. And I think it's very much about, like, it's okay to accept help. Yes. Like, that seems to be the theme. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very, very cute. She's very intimidated by the uh, better designs that her neighbors have. For their homes. I feel like there's different ways of interpreting it. There's, like, the, um, she's feels like her home design is too amateurish, while all of her neighbors have, like, these elaborate, perfectly designed homes, versus the other one is, like... 
you know, she's finally out on her own space and she imagined it as her own space. But, you know, now the neighbors are trying to be neighborly and she's like, no, no, my space and trying to find individual space. You know, I feel like both interpretations uh, are valid. Yeah, I feel like the first time I watched the movie or the short film, whatever, I I had that interpretation where it's like, oh, she's trying to do things on her own because, you know, that's what you do when you you move out. But the, the this next time I was I was watching it this last time. It was like, oh, she's kind of intimidated. I didn't get that before. Yeah. It's um completely hand-drawn. Is it the first Pixar content that's completely hand-drawn? Yeah, I think so. Pixar has dabbled in 2D animation before, specifically for like day, day and night. night. Yeah. Yeah. But this is the first that's like completely hand-animated, as far as I know. And it's so cute. It's very cute. It reminds, uh, Carrie mentioned this and I was thinking it too, it looks a lot like uh, Ernest and Celestine. Yeah, it er- does. Let me try that again. It looks a lot like Ernest and Celestine, which is a, a French animated film from a few years ago, yeah. which is very like storybook illustration and cute. Yeah, it it has this really neat dashed line art, which makes it look kind of, like it kind of somehow blends the characters into the background just a little bit. And, you know, it makes everything have a soft aesthetic. The badger in particular, like super reminded me of Ernest, 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 um, both times that I watched it. Really cute short. All the animals make cute little noises. It's so cute. The sound mm-hmm. design is very, very good. Oh, there's actually like one part where she's finally yields and is asking for help and she like paps the ground and it makes a really satisfying wet little tap sound. <laughs> I like it's it's very good. And then uh, she especially pulls like, her ears over her eyes and the little bunnies squeak. Yeah. It's like the cutest thing I've ever seen. Oh my god. Yeah, that, like, that's the thing about pantomime, right? Like, like there's no dialogue. Um, you gotta kind of make up for the lack of dialogue in other aspects. So in the yeah. acting, in the folly and sound design. Uh, yeah, very nice to see something super unique from Pixar like that. Yeah, what I, um, so there was an article where I interviewed the director, uh, I want to make sure I pronounce her name right, Madeline Sharafia, Sharafian? Sharafian, I think. Yeah, so she was talking about how when she decided she wanted to do a 2D short, a lot of people at Pixar who are fans of 2D immediately just wanted to jump on the project and... Like, in an interview, they asked her, like, it seems as though the next direction for animated movies actually is more experimentation with visual styles. So, yeah, especially especially because of streaming, like, opening up the market a bit. Like, the director even said that because of streaming, there's more small projects that people are working on, and they have smaller budgets, and it gives people a little more room to experiment with style. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that reminds me of a lot of things like Love, Death, and Robots, which I mentioned before, the other Spark Shorts. And Disney had their own thing. They had um, uh, a short short circuit, yeah, um, which I want to watch again because it was really cool. But, like, all these experimental shorts. And then you have, like, features, like, Into the Spider-Verse. Like, we're in a freaking golden age of animation right now. Yeah. And every time I see some asshole on Twitter say, it's better when I was a kid. These shows is Steven Universe. It's just like shut up, <laughs> shut up, shut up. Well, that's the thing. Uh, Tom Moore from uh, Cartoon Saloon when he he says when they were shopping around the Secret of Kells, Pixar was one of their biggest supporters, and they were like, "Oh, we love two D animation. We love what you you were doing." Oh, so it makes sense yeah. that like they would try to do something like this eventually. Nice. Yeah, I talked about the Disney Renaissance a little bit. Well, the second Renaissance. And like one of the things that got me excited was 2D animation was going to be making this big resurgence. Enchanted was the first Disney movie to have 2D animation since they shut that department down. Mm. And so we got in short succession Enchanted, then The Princess and the Frog, which was like fully 2D animated, and then Winnie the Pooh, and then it died again. So, womp, womp. Uh, I, which I think was just kind of a matter of circumstances. There was a lot of big releases that those you movies came out again. You idiots Monks. released Winnie the Pooh opposite Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, you clods. <laughs> like, honestly. Like, yes, it's, you might think it's a different market, but I mean, that was, like, before, like, Avengers was a thing, Deathly Hallows Part 2 had to be, like, the biggest event movie we've seen in a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they also released uh, Princess and the Frog opposite Alvin and the Chipmunks, and that siphoned yeah, off the a squeak- lot of the box office. <laughs> yeah. Which kind of robbed its market but also avatar was out like at the same time yeah. which would have robbed like a lot 
Yeah. Everyone was seeing Avatar 20 times, so. For some reason. For some reason. <laughs> I saw it once, and it's like the only 3D movie that ever gave me a headache. I liked it in theaters. It's just a matter of like the story being kind of paper thin, but the world building and the visuals, ooh. Mm. I never saw it in theaters. That's got some sequels coming out, which we will talk about on this podcast, because Avatar is animated, James Cameron. It is. Yeah, Don't be an elitist. Jimmy. Yes. We are slowly going to defeat this mindset that animation is somehow lesser. It's okay for things to be animated. It doesn't give it more clout to be live action. Why? Yeah, and I mean, that's... Uh, that's We could get into that, because yeah. with all the Disney live action things. But this podcast is running very long. Yeah, there is one more thing I wanted to say before we go to the feature, and that is... Those Disney shorts that are experimental on YouTube actually made me mad that they can do all of these unique visual styles and yet we never see it in their physical, in their actual features. It only shows up in those shorts. So I am super happy to see more bleed over anyway. I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Def- definitely, definitely, definitely. <sighs> Especially when you put it up against, like I said before, all their like female leads are like all the, the exact same character design lately. Yeah. Ugh. They literally reuse the baby Moana for the baby in <laughs> Get Ralph 2. That's true. <laughs> and that is one of the few disappointing things about Ryan the Last Dragon is that she does kind of give off Moana vibes in terms of design. She really does. Yeah. So they have two designs, one for white women, one for brown women. Anyway, <laughs> let's get to the feature. <laughs> oh, that's right. No. <laughs> Very uh, Birdman improvisational jest. <laughs> yeah. It's the person playing My Heart Will Go On on the recorder. <laughs> Oh, it's this movie is gorgeous immediately. Uh, wow, that's that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the whole that, <laughs> that's the review. That's the whole episode. Yeah, it starts with Joe Gardner, our main character, uh, Pixar's first black lead. That's cool. He is a <coughs> band teacher at a school, and can can someone like break down how beautiful like this scene is? Like, it's for something so mundane. Carrie, you made the most notes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um. So like. Something about the textures and the lighting and everything has just been elevated in this movie. Like, the way that... What really got me is the way that Joe's hands look while he's on the piano keys. You can just, like, see all the individual bones and muscles, and it's so gorgeously detailed. Ugh. Very, very piano player hands. Yeah. Yeah. I actually didn't make notes about the beginning, though. Yeah. (laughs) Most of my notes on the visual design are in the ethereal realm, which... Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, Visually like, speaking, it's much more impressive. But even then, like, this is a very unique mixture of a uh, kind of realistic New York City and more stylized character design that I think they were trying to do with the good dinosaur, but it didn't ugh. really mesh very well. Oh, good, good dinosaur is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> like, a- the, the backgrounds are freaking amazing when you consider all of it is animated, but... Yeah, yeah, this is like borderline photorealistic backgrounds sometimes. Yeah, and like like you said, the textures, like you can see like the felt texture of uh, Joe's hat and like just... And like the sweat when the... When they're playing When they're playing jazz for like prolonged periods of time. Oh, yeah. God, yes. Something about the lighting, something about the textures, it's all like very, very solid and real, but, but the cartoony designs don't clash. They, I think they nailed it. Yeah. yeah, like Joe's design is very like spindle. Like his legs are very spindly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It reminded me of uh, Rhapsody in Blue from Fantasia 2000. Oh, I don't remember which one that is. <laughs> it's the one in New York City. Oh, it's the one that Eric. Go- it's the one that Eric Goldberg animated, emulating ah. uh, what's his face's style. Um, uh, the caricaturist Al-, Al Hirschfeld. Yeah, yeah, that's the best segment in Fantasia 2000. <laughs> hmm. I like the Firebird suite. Well, yeah, that's good. So too. we're going to have to get a divorce. No. <laughs> I'm with um, Becca. Firebird is my... F- well, I do like Rhapsody in Blue, but the Firebird was always my favorite part of that. Anyway, tangent. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just continuing with the plot. He gets offered a full-time position at the school, uh, but he's also offered a chance to play jazz with the legendary Dorothea Williams at the jazz club. And so... <laughs> at, the, at the jazz club. The there's ja- there's the, only one in New York City. <laughs> the only one. And it's uh, constantly stalked by uh, Ryan Gosling <laughs> from La La Land. <laughs> so, 
So he, he, like, his dream is to be a jazz player. So he wants to go and play with Dorothea. But his mom wants him to take the practical approach of, like, the full-time job with, you know, security and benefits. Pension. Pension. That's <laughs> kind of where the conflict comes from here. It's follow your dreams or do the practical thing. Yeah. Oh, now I remember what it was about the intro scene that really got me. And it's the feel of him getting in the zone and playing jazz and like his little fan gush about, you know, how putting the little minor in it. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Dude, feel that. I, the first time we watched this, I was on the brink of tears the entire time. Never mind the state I was in at the end, but we'll get to that. Like, I real, I agree. Like, I felt it. Like, there's so much passion. I'm, my note is that this soul is to piano what Coco was to guitar. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, like, more. Yeah, it really, it gets more into, like, Coco is more about the emotional impact that music can have on people. This is about the joy of self-expression through the act of piano. That's the same thing. I gotta, yeah, I didn't word that very well, but, yeah, whatever. Yeah. There's so many cool character designs in this movie. I really like uh, Dorothea Williams' design. Like, she's, like, like really imposing, but also, like, really beautiful, but, like, really tough, and I want her to step on me. <laughs> but, but, she, but she wouldn't, like, even honor me with the bottom of her shoe, you know? No, she wouldn't. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> but, oh, man, the, the shot when he first walks into the jazz club and she's kind of got her back to him playing the... Tr- the uh, saxophone. The saxophone looks so. <laughs> it looks so good. Like the again, the lighting, the textures, the saxophone. It looks real, but it doesn't clash with anything. Like I don't know how they did it. I don't. I don't get it. Yeah. One of the things that this movie excels at is the weight of things. Like that is one of the key elements to selling animation is making things feel the correct weight. So, Ooh. you know, like Dorothea, the way she carries herself is very solid where the souls feel like they have no weight to them. Yeah. It, 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 this is this is like a tour de force in getting things to be the proper weight and having a certain like special certain ways of moving to that coincides with their personalities and their emotions. A tour de force. Tour de force. Tour de force. Kind of a tangent, but that reminds me. Um, we were watching the Lego Movie two the other day, and um, as you do, <laughs> as you do, <laughs> and uh, they nailed the weight of that movie because, like, there's a shot where there's like a crane moving, but it's got the weight of a Lego crane. Like, it's not heavy, and that like really sells that it's Lego. You know? Yeah. And yeah. Like, weight in animation is so important. And, like, it's something you don't really think about. Well, at least I don't really think about unless it's, like, done really unconvincingly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. There is a lot of slapstick later in this movie, and that completely depends on being able to follow where the character's center of gravity is. And yeah, for sure. they, again, like I talked about with the spindly leg design, it, they really make you feel it. Mm. That's very, very good, uh, like, basic principles of animation stuff, like center of gravity and weight and things like that so i guess he opts to do the jazz thing and then he dies yes immediately (laughs) well not immediately he narrowly avoids death for several times he's so excited that he walks through the street very very carelessly (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. um but uh got him he falls down a manhole which y'all y'all have seen in the trailers a man has fallen into a sewer grate in new york city (laughs) (laughs) um everyone was worried about this, that he would be this little blobby boy for the whole movie, which that's a really valid criticism, like following things like Brother Bear Emperor's New yeah. Groove and Princess and the Frog. It's a bad streak. For... Of people of color characters being not in their bodies for most of the movie. Yeah. Um, you could argue that for Emperor's New Groove, everyone else is a person of color, so that's eh, true. Eh, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I think they struck a good balance, which we'll get more into as we go. But um, so he wakes up in his little blobby form. Okay, can I gush about this for a second? It's a very wispy CGI design, but his glasses and his fingertips have outlines. You're right. Yes. And a lot of the uh, other souls will see, like, they have, I think all their fingertips have outlines, but then, like, other accessories also, which, that's just cool. Yeah. It's cool, man. This movie does a lot with the visual style. It blends 2D and 3D elements a lot. Hmm. Like, not just in the soul blobs, but also in the, like, overseers of the soul realm. Like, yeah. The Jerry's. They are 2D. Oh, we, we, I, I know we're not I, there I gotta yet, gush but. about them, too. We're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
so he's going up the escalator towards the great beyond, which is just this big. The, it's all the bright fire, light at the end of the tunnel. All these fireflies stuck is, up in that big bluish black thing. It is such a cool, like, the sets in this movie are so huge and ambitious yeah. in yeah, design. Are. Like, I mean, they'd have to be. It's New York City. Yeah. And also the great beyond. So he's going up this escalator, but he's not ready to die. So he tries to jump off it, but there's like a barrier, but he rips through it. Well, yeah, like uh, one of the cool things about the great beyond is that like, it's just, you know, the typical what you hear from people who have a near-death experience. It's the bright light at the end of the tunnel and they're kind of going towards it. Yeah. And the way they slowly escalate towards that light with like all the little star shapes appearing and then growing together and getting brighter. It's just this really cool effect. And they don't get too religious about it. It's, it's not very like, non-denominational. It's not, yeah, it's non-denominational. It's, there's no... It doesn't show us what's beyond the Great Beyond, because, like, when the souls go towards it, they, they just bl- bug, buzz bug out, like... Yeah. Which and is it's like, okay. The Great <laughs> Celestial Bug Zapper. Yeah. And, like, very open to interpretation what happens there. Like, this movie doesn't assume yeah. A, yeah. a correct answer, which is very nice. Um, So, Joe realizes, oh, oh, sh- oh crap, I died, but he's not ready to die. His life was just about to start. So he tries to jump off the escalator. There's like a barrier, an invisible barrier, but he tears through it and... He, uh, oh, boundary breaks. Holy sh! I love this sequence. It have is y'all ever, awesome. Oh, have you ever seen a sequence like this in, like, a feature film? Uh, not a feature film, but it reminds me of uh, a lot of, like, indie games I've played, like yeah. Limbo and... Yeah, for sure. Stuff like that. Disney has played around with, like, abstract line work like this especially back in the 40s but it has been so long since something like that has shown up in a mainstream animated feature i, I love like the this is the sequence and then they show the title it's like very ooh. Uh, it's, i can't even like describe the sequence with words it's like black backgrounds white lines it's very 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 abstract like Watch this movie. Can we compare it to the abstract thought scene in Inside Out? It's a similar... Yes. Kind of. Yeah. It's like everything kind of shears and turns into line art and it goes black and white and then it comes back together and stretches and the proportions distort and there's all these abstract lines spinning and twirling out in space. It's just a really cool sequence. Beautiful. I love it. And the music that's playing through this, like it reminds me of the ethereal like binaural beat loops on YouTube. So it just has this like otherworldly meditative feel to it oh god that like this scene is just such pure mood i love it yeah trent Reznor did the soundtrack he did. <laughs> him and he collaborated with who atticus ross yeah atticus ross and trent Reznor. it's the My mention, there's there's very um a, a very distinct musical palette between the soul world and the real world yeah the soul world feels a lot more like what carrie said and also reminded me of the portal soundtrack <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, that's why I loved it. It dug into that part of me. <laughs> yeah, and wh- whereas the real world is much more jazz influenced. Yeah. God, this sequence so made me really, really wish I could have seen this in a theater. I know. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, what, what would that have looked like in 3D? Ooh, 3D. Ooh. That's, that's a thing. That's question. <laughs> yeah, you're right. 3D does still exist, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I hope that when circumstances are better, maybe they'll, like do a theatrical run of this that would be nice. that would be really nice i i hope so yeah maybe um so then he lands in the uh in the great before uh which is where all baby souls are born yes and once again it's like very open to interpretation like they don't really explain where the souls come from or why the little camp counselor jerry's are looking after them yeah Ugh. what the purpose of this all is it's very it's just very this is what this is <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's very pastel it's not like nothing about the design leans one way or the other like weirdly like how can you make something so like subjective or is that the word i'm looking for something that's so yeah like something a con- an existential concept that everyone has like their own opinions about but like make it universal yeah, yeah. subjective yeah, yeah. is like referring to the individual subject versus the objective which is like there is one truth out there yeah, so yeah okay. this is definitely subjective i like the music i like the tone okay and then like uh jason mentioned the little camp counselor jerry's who just instantly put me at ease i want them to live with me because then <laughs> i would never have anxiety again this entire sequence is like anti-anxiety. It's yeah. just very, very calm. 
something about all the color palettes and the soft lighting coming from the Jerry's and there's these little soft tips. It's like fuzzy and felty and uh, it's just very, it's very soothing. It feels like an incubation area. So the Jerry's are like based on like shadows (coughs) cast by wire sculptures. So they're like these flat shapes with some lines like one continuous line and then a line in the middle for their features. And they all have really cute accents, which is Pixar coming for me specifically <laughs> because <laughs> I love cute and endearing accents. They're, they're, the character design is a lot like a UPA movie What is for U- the Jerry's. What is UPA? Well, you know, like the, like Gerald McBoing Boing short. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, yes. they did that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's true. Good, good call. Uh, you say words, Carrie. Again, I'm just like, okay, so the design of them, it's it's a 2D design. Like, lines can just move over each other in a 2D space, and that's a representation of their arm moving in 3D, but it's 2D. Mm. It's really cool. And the shape and the filling in of the color between the lines changes. Like when one line goes this way, it's like the solid color in the middle. And then if it goes the other way, you can see straight through it. Like it. Yeah. Like this is a character design that you want to watch just because it's a fascinating character design. And it's just like being captivated by this cool idea that they came up with. And there's a lot of that in this movie. Totally. And like, this feels like almost like the Into the Spider-Verse of Disney Pixar because it is so (laughs) ambitious, you know? Soul is the dark souls of Pixar movies. (laughs) (laughs) I do think this is the furthest that Pixar has pushed their visual boundaries. They tried so many things in this movie that are like way out there from their normal, like just very CG style. Can we talk about how all the Jerry's are also non-binary icons? Yes. Yes. And Terry, too. And Terry. I love Terry. I thought Terry was voiced by a a man when I first saw this, but no, not so. That one guy that takes his job way too seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kept interpreting the little round thing on the side of their head as an ear, but it's supposed to be like a bun. (laughs) God. And played by the same woman who played Moana's grandma. Yes. Ah. You're very talented. Oh, I love them. I could just write, like, my note is I could write a 500-page essay about how much I love the Jerry's and Terry. So let's not do that and just continue. Uh, uh. Yeah. How far do we want to go before dropping the spoiler warning? Um, Probably not yet. No. Not, not, just not yet. yet. Not yet. But yeah, so Joe gets mistaken for a mentor. Apparently certain souls that are headed towards the great beyond get to come and be mentors to the developing souls in the great before. And Joe, trying to escape the view of the authorities, just, like, grabs a random name tag to be incognito. Dr. Borgensen. (laughs) That's not right. Um, Yeah. And, like, mentors have all been, like, notable people, like Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa, all these. Mike Wazowski? Yeah, there's Mm -hmm. there's a scene later where there's a bunch of name tags on a wall, and, like, every notable person you could think of in your brain is on that wall. Including Mike Wazowski. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Wazowski. Hell? <laughs> they say hell in this movie. They do. They say hell. The, hell. Joe is worried if this is uh, heaven or H-E double hockey sticks. Novels. Hell, hell. Is this heaven? <laughs> no. <gasps> then is it H-E double hockey stick? Hell, 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 hell. hell. <laughs> From the mouths of babes. <laughs> so he, so that he gets assigned a soul. So the way they do this is like, they're on stage assigning the souls. The the Jerry says, and this is number 200 billion such and such such. And here's number 22. And 22 gets assigned to Joe. So 22 has been avoiding becoming alive for a while. A long while. She's not into it. Wouldn't 22 be non-binary too? I suppose so, yeah. technically. I well, think they call her she throughout the movie. But well, yeah. Well, I think it's because, I think it's, yeah, it's because 22 is voiced by a middle-aged white lady. So, you know, we, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I choose this voice because it's the most annoying. (laughs) Um, All the little baby souls have like on their chest, they have like a little nucleus of like their different personality traits and her core nucleus is like a jackass (laughs) because she is. Um, Now listen here, you little (laughs) <laughs> yeah the point of the mentors in the great before is basically to fill in the soul's personality before they jump down to earth yes to find their spark yes their spark yeah which of course joe, like joe assumes 
he, his entire life has been building up to being a jazz performer. It's like he knows what it, it's what he was born to. So he interprets the spark as like the thing that these souls were born to do. The one thing that inspires them to live. And that's how we start with our frame of reference. Joe and 22 strike a deal. If she finds her spark, she gets her, her nucleus thing turns into a patch that lets her jump down the portal into Earth. Because uh, Joe can't use that portal. Because he's dead. Um, but if he can, if she gives him her patch, then he can go to Earth. So they strike a deal that he'll help her fill in the last thing, and she will give him her patch. And how do they do this? Through a bunch of contrived plot motivating things, <laughs> which is my one criticism with this movie. <laughs> like, if I'm being a total nitpicker, why can't the patch be transferred until it becomes an Earth pass? And why can it be transferred then? I don't know if that makes sense, but okay, it gives you an excuse to have the rest of the plot happen so whatever i just don't dwell on it yeah. yes so they go through uh uh just a box it's just a box and they go through it <laughs> and that's contextless for anyone who's watching oh and it's another case of kind of like the jerry's where it's a 3d form but like with outlines mm -hmm. they go into this like little secret cubby space that 22 has and they come out the other side what is this place this is the uh astral what, what do they call it? No, the zone. They call it the zone. Yeah, I just call it the astral plane. I'm going to say my, minor spoiler warning from this point on, because I don't think this was in trailers. Yeah. For those who don't want the minor spoilers, let's just say this is Pixar's probably most ambitious movie in terms of visual design. It's beautiful, and I would say it's one of their more adult movies in terms of themes. Absolutely. It leaves everything yeah. very open-ended, and you get to interpret what is happening it's a movie that gets you to ask questions as opposed to giving you simplistic answers. Mm, for sure. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely their most adult outing. But uh, let's continue. So it's the zone. What is the zone? We kind of had it teased before, didn't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the beginning when uh, Joe is playing with <coughs> Dorothea to impress her and get in her quartet, he kind of gets lost in the music and like the 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 lighting gets all uh what the the colors <laughs> what do you the, they're like, like blue and purple and it, like the world around him fades away it becomes kind of like a misty diamondy ballroom type feel yeah and it turns out that that's like when someone gets in the zone with their passion they kind of like ascend to this like soul plane where like it's a, it's this black desert and you see in the sky all the souls who are in the zone doing their thing. It's cool. Yeah, it's a place between the physical world and the the soul world, yeah. What else is here in the soul zone? This zone zone. An awesome hippie ship. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we see something before that. What do we see? I'm quizzing you guys. <laughs> um, what's Make in the, the desert? Make the tree. Make the tree. Make the tree. Yeah, it. it's these like uh, blobbis... Sand monsters. Blobbis. Yeah, that, that uh, are the result of like a, a soul that gets like kind of trapped in its own anxiety or dark feelings. And uh, or either that or it, it, someone who gets too into the zone and forgets to like, you know, live, they become those blob things too. Yeah, I think it's explained as like, these are where souls that have lost their connection to the physical world end up if they're lost. And either through the positive, like getting in the zone or through the losing yourself. Yeah. And we actually do see like somebody with a metal detector who's obsessed over finding this thing suddenly become lost, like, like it's an obsession. I, this the entire design of this area is just so, so cool to me. I love again, everything in this movie is just mood. Mood. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, uh, there was a ship. What is this ship? What What the heck? Well, 22 takes uh, Joe there to meet, uh, what's his name? Uh, what is it? This Moonwind. Moonwind. Who are, who are the other ones? Yeah, Moonwind and some other uh, I think spiritual the, I, mystics. I think one of them is just called Moon Moon or something. They're just like various like meta like people who teach meditation and spiritual like they're hippies. Yeah. They're hippies. <laughs> so like meditation is another way to get to this realm, but you kind of have like control of yourself, I guess. Um, it's a way to ascend <laughs> the to the other plane, yeah. which Moon which Moon Dancer does by. <laughs> he's, this is like actually I don't want to spoil this gag. It's very funny. Moon Dancer. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, Moon, moon yeah, Wind. I think it's Moon Wind. Moon Dancer is like Gen 1 My Little Pony. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The Twilight Sparkle was based off of. Yes. Anyway, nerd. <laughs> <laughs>
hey, my little pony is good. Fight me. <laughs> so Moodwin helps Joe find uh, his body that is like kind of in a coma back in New York City. Because his soul didn't go to the Great Beyond, so he didn't die. Yeah. So in his haste, Joe like jumps through the little... Thin spot, they call thin it. Thin spot, yeah, that connects the two planes, and he accidentally takes 22 with him. So they both land like in New York, but oh no, <laughs> shenanigans. So uh, I think it's fair to drop like the more heavy, heavy spoiler warning at this point. Um, yes, 22, tw- 22 soul lands in uh, in Joe. Oops. And and where does Joe's soul end up? Yeah, therapy cat. Therapy cat. Which this, therapy is, this cat. is the part of the movie that I was the most concerned that they were going to just go like, oh my God, are we really doing this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, hot take. Disney keeps doing this. They did this in Big Hero 6 as well. Calico cats can't be male. So this is not Mr. Mittens. This is Miss Mittens. Well, they can be male. They but can it's be, like but they die. Rare. Because, oh, here's uh, Becca's education corner for all the listeners. Um, the chromosome that carries the code to make a cat orange or black is in the X chromosome. So for a cat to be orange and black, it has to have two X chromosomes. So calicos are always female. The amount of male calico cats is so negligible. Like, I can't believe Disney keeps doing this. Do, do they not have cat people anywhere in the studio? Apparently not. Yeah. No. Well, I know. I, I'm pretty sure there's some cat people since Kit Bull was a thing. That's true. Oh, yeah. Speaking of shorts with cool visual designs, anyway, tangent. But then, okay, so yeah, Joel so lands in a cat, and I was extremely concerned that this meant that the cat died, because they kind of teased that it did. The cat is okay, people. <laughs> the it, cat it, lives. The cat makes it out yes. of the movie, <laughs> thankfully. Movies aren't typically very kind to cats these days. <laughs> So I'm really glad that the cat didn't die. These days. <laughs> okay, yeah, ever. So I don't, is there a whole lot to, we talked a lot about the first act. The second act is a lot more in the conventional kind of Pixar road trip buddy movie. Yeah. But it's still kind of unique because like it's 22 living out the experiences of Earth in Joe's body. Yeah. Okay, here's something I really loved. And it's something very important for like body swap plots is the acting of joe's body changes because it's not joe it's 22 and she's very um she's very unsure and scared and like she could have very easily been a super annoying character and she almost was in act one but uh to me she became like really endearing in act two yeah so that that saved the character for me this was where i became the most concerned in terms of plot because they start moving down towards a lot of the typical like low quality animated movie b esque that's contrived but fortunately they avoided most of the pitfalls like when this part of the plot starts it will likely concern a lot of people don't be concerned they don't do the predictable thing that you're expecting act two probably is the weakest part of the movie but it's not it's not bad by any means yeah they do do a little bit too much of oh now we're on a ticking clock to get you back to your bodies and a little bit too much of the we gotta go do the thing so that we can do the thing so that we can do the other thing it's like a it's like a quest string in a video game where you get this item from this person give it to this item to get this item for that person and with a time limit so it is a little contrived but it's fine yeah it's like they handled it well and also This was most important to me is that I was afraid, oh, God, they're really doing the, like, character of color in a, like, transformed body again. But when it matters, they give the agency back to the actor at a key moment, which thank you, Pixar. Thank you. Speaking of, I haven't seen the Cosby show in, like, a good couple of years because, you know, but uh, I recognize the voice of Joe's mother immediately. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't know it was her, but I was like, I know that voice. <laughs> yeah, they have a time limit. The government calls it 6.30. <laughs> Moonwind's boss is an ass in this. Yes. It's like, good God. <laughs> How lucky are they that uh, Moon Dancer or whatever is. Moonwind. <laughs> whatever is, in, is also in New York. Yeah, yeah that, that was quite lucky that Moonwind is in a place in New York that Joe recognizes and that they can physically get to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the mechanics of all of this is a little bit contrived. It's like, okay, so they just happen to have this portal that can take them down, and they have a way to get them back, and they have a way to, you know, like... (laughs) (laughs) Ding! (laughs) 
Um, so they're doing their little fetch quest. Meanwhile, Terry, who we kind of mentioned but didn't really explain before, is the accountant of the Jerry's, and they make sure that everyone who's supposed to go to the Great Beyond does. Um, but their count is short, um, so they come to our world to uh, find Joe. And I really, really love how they move, like... They move, like, through the cracks in the floor, like, between the tiles and stuff, and, like, along the walls and the brickwork and everything. It's it's neat. Yeah, it's, it's really Very. cool. I will say, um, also, that, like, when 22 first goes outside in Joe's body and is, like, experiencing the senses of life for the first time, there is some excellent camera work to sell you on. Like, they oh. do a POV oh. shot, and I will let you uh, say what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you could tell I was excited. Um in the real world, there's the cinematography is different versus in the uh, soul world. It's a lot more natural. Like there's little bobs and movements to it. Just oh, yeah. and meanwhile, in the soul world, it's a lot more you know blocked. Blocked. Yeah, to use a technical movie boy term. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Also, when they go into New York, like again, the it's good to use cinematography to sell a certain mood. They do it great. Yeah. Like they have really rapid cut editing so that, you know, it's a little bit disorienting and they do like a long shot where y- you just see this sea of people moving all around. It's like, the uh, shot is so good. Hmm. It's so good. As somebody who's not much of a city person, it's like, Oh, I felt that. Yeah. That is exactly what it felt like for me being in New York City. I love the culture of the place, but so many people, so many noises. Yeah. So they have a lot of little misadventures while they're in the in this world. Like one of Joe's students, uh, Connie, comes and she wants to quit music. And 22 is like, yeah, quit music. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to hang out with Connie. <laughs> yeah. Oh my but it, God. <laughs> but, it, uh, but, it, but then like 22 gets like inspired by the fact that Connie, you know, she actually loves music. Maybe that's her spark. Yeah. Um, the delivery of that line killed me, by the way. I'd rather hang out with Connie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tear up the sofa. Wait, why about I do that? <laughs> that's my sofa. Um, 22 is very good. Um, yeah, there's great, I don't know if you guys talked about this because I had to do kitty removal, but, like, there's great cat humor as well as, like, great, true. like, yeah. out-of-body experience humor. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Joe has the, okay, so they gotta get Joe's body in a suit and all ready to go do his gig with Dorothea Williams. Um, cat Joe has the awful idea to trim his hair. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> what, <laughs> this, this well, Why would stupid. he do this? <laughs> why would he do this? He's a cat. <laughs> He stands on, like, a pile of records and holds the razor with his, like, cat paws. Um, <laughs> well, 22 doesn't know how to open doors or push buttons, so, like, there's a scene well, yeah, in the but hospital where... But, like, where... Just, just, just don't do it. Just go to the, just go to the barber in or the first place. Or just don't. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I, I'll, I'll allow it because it leads to, like, a really nice scene at the, at the barber shop. Yeah, big kudos on that scene. Yeah, Des is the barber, and I love him. He's so soft. Yeah. Yes. And I want to talk to him. Yeah, you put it in your notes, Carrie, and like it's just like a you know a thing in real life that barbershops are a really important part of you know black culture. Mm. Yeah, like oh, so we should talk about that a little bit. This is the scene that um, Kemp Powers, who was basically um, he was brought on to help Pixar with the storyline and also to help like the original cut of this movie didn't have a lot of specific black culture things because Pete Doctor was kind of scared of getting things wrong. So Mm. Kent Powers, when he came in, you know, he was in there as a story consultant. And so he looked at it and he basically explained to Pete Doctor that the hairstyle that Joe had looks like a little bit of an unkempt hair. And like this would usually be when they go to the barbershop. So Kent Powers is the one that suggested this barbershop scene. And like this part of the movie has a very, very good air of authenticity to it. Definitely. Yeah. And eventually, Kent Powers contributed so much to the movie that he was credited as a co-director. So, awesome. Mm. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Like, in addition to being very male-dominated, Pixar is also very white-dominated. Um, they seem to be getting better at that, like, with their shorts and yeah, stuff. Yeah, they're trying. Um, they're, they're trying, which is, I mean, you gotta, you gotta respect effort as long as it's genuine, you know? Yeah, Pete Doctor is doing a lot of work to, like, diversify the studio more and to give um directors like female directors and pers- people of color directors a bigger role yeah for example uh domi shi 
the original cut of Bao, the original ending was she eats her dumpling child, but like, and Domi was originally going to cut it because she's like, nah, that, that'll read is too weird to the white audiences. Mm, and and Pete Doctor was like, no, that that's genuine. Put it in. <laughs> yeah. We, we saw it. Well, whatever. It won the Oscar, so people are wrong. <laughs> Yeah, we all well, yeah. we saw Incredibles two together. That's like the only movie the three of us have seen together in person. Yeah, and, and everybody in the theater when she ate the dumpling kid was just oh, <laughs> like, it's a metaphor. I just like, realized yeah, I, I shouldn't I, invoke the Oscars to give credibility. Like I can't just yeah. out. I can't just dump on the Oscars and then use them as a defense when it's convenient for my argument. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. What are you, a conservative Republican? <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. Anyway, uh, Joe, 22 Joe gets a haircut, gets a lollipop. David Diggs is here as Joe's rival, and we had the gag of never gonna get the gig now because he's giving a hard time. <laughs> That's a Hamilton reference. Ain't never gonna get the gig now. Yeah. Um, but 22 puts him in his place. It's very good. <laughs> 22 like has a bluntness that like people have to learn that there's things that you don't say to other people and 22 has not learned mm-hmm. that obviously so like yeah. <laughs> it's just a cool scene like it's one of those scenarios where like 22 as as she's experiencing life is getting more of an understanding in the world and falling in love with it more and more. And Joe is kind of like by proxy experiencing the world through like these starry child eyes of all the little tiny things. And uh, it's so oh, beautiful. It's so cute. It's- he's also very dismissive about it too. Like he's very yes. like single-minded, like, Oh, we got to go do this thing. Like you're, you're just enjoying these things. Cause you're in my body and yeah. I enjoy those things. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that comes up later in a way that f-ing destroyed me, but we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, I think we're moving into major spoiler spoiler territory. Yeah, major spoiler. Yeah, we don't want to probably talk too much about like the intricate plot details going forward. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I do want to talk about the themes a little bit because, like, again, this is one of Pixar's more nuanced movies in terms of themes that invites the audience to come up with their own interpretation and questions. Yeah, yeah. let's let's kind of chill it on doing like a full play by play like summary, but let's talk about a couple more scenes that we want to talk about. Like Carrie, you talked about the scene where Joe's actor gets the agency back. Do you want to explain what that was? Oh yeah. So basically through the whole movie, Joe's mother has been very dismissive of his art. Basically, apparently Joe was inspired to play jazz by his dad. His dad pretty much died pretty poor, and her tailor shop is what paid for his Uh, music hobby and so you know she really wants joe to take a stable job and make money and have stable health insurance etc um and a pension and so finally he because he acts because he ripped his suit he has to go he has no choice but to go to the tailor shop that his mom owns to get himself like nice and tidied up before his audition and the only way to do that is by confronting her and at a key moment during that confrontation joe like it starts the scene with joe as a cat telling 22 what to say he finally decides no i'm tired of running i have to confront her about this and then it cuts away from like the possible humorous thing of the cat telling the human what to say and it pans and once you get to the other side of the pan, it is Joe talking in Joe's voice with Joe's body. And it, I was just like, thank you, Pixar. You gave him the agency during the scene that mattered. Yeah, yeah. it was yeah, very definitely. Very good. Oh, and that, like, that confrontation scene is just, uh, it wrecks me. Yeah. Oh, so many things wreck me about this movie. Um, so they, like, go to the meeting place where they're going to meet moon dream to moon wind. <laughs> i don't care <laughs> to, to uh moon wind is, like, the new, is the new benedict cumber batch of this podcast where we will say his <laughs> name wrong on purpose every time for humorous i'm effects. just stupid <laughs> <laughs> um so they meet at the jazz club and there's this really cute scene of 22 who's just like looking around and it's just this quiet scene like joe cat joe's voice kind of fades out and like this little whirly seed comes down and it's so pretty and i think like 22 is like realizing wait well well, maybe life ain't so bad i like this life thing yeah oh this shot reminds me of like a ghibli film just the small like appreciating the beauty of the moment like that is it's so rare in a western film to have those moments where you just pause and soak up the atmosphere yeah there's a like jumping around and not getting too much into spoilers but uh 
after a conflict arises between Joe and 22, Joe is able to get back into his body for a short while and play with Dorothea. But like at the very end of it, he's like, he just has this feeling like, is this it? I expected more. And she, she has this really deep line that this movie made me think. Yeah. <laughs> I heard this story once about a fish, a young fish who goes up to an older fish and says, I'm looking for the ocean. And he says, this is the ocean. And the fish is like, what? No, this is water. What I want is the ocean. Yeah. She she said... She puts it more eloquently. Yeah. Oh, she's so cool. Um. Yeah, Joe is just, like, lost. Like, this is... He achieved his dream, but, like, that's it. And, like, she says to him, well, tomorrow we do it again. And it's just, like, the same monotony he was dismissing before. Yep. By the way, this is the reason Pete Doctor made this movie. This was the inspiration for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Basically, after Inside Out, he had just won all the awards and gotten all the credit. And now it's like, Uh, now what? Now what? Yeah. Yeah. You've peaked. Now what? (laughs) Like, what what comes after, you know? You've achieved your dreams. Because life goes on. (laughs) Life goes on. Before we start getting too into the themes, I want to talk about... This is nuclear spoilers, but um, 20... Okay. (laughs) I could not talk about this movie to my husband for like a week because of how seen I was by this part. But okay. So 22 is back in the soul world. She has become a lost soul because with Joe being so dismissive and saying things like, oh, you're only appreciating life because you're in my body. It's like, it's not you, it's me. She believes that she's not good enough to live. And so Joe gets like pulled into her... um, uh, her blobby her sand body, her <laughs> sand body, and oh, f- this messed me up. But there's these like silhouettes of every mentor she's ever had, like just saying things like, "Oh, no one will ever like you. You're so annoying," and all this. And then come to her standing there with this big silhouette of Joe standing over her, saying, saying what he said to her before, but with an edge of cruelty to it that wasn't really there, but yeah. how she you know, internalized it. Yeah. Holy sh! I am seen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was sobbing at this part because that's exactly how my anxiety works. I've been through this so many times and this has been, Same. this was just the perfect representation of it. Oof. Oof. Definitely oof. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Hmm. It's pretty emotional. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Wrecked me. Yeah. Visually, it also reminded me of, like, the the witch scene from Paranorman, where it's just, yeah. like, the oh, swirling yeah. storm around it. It's just, uh, everything. Again, that that's my summary of this movie, is just mood. Like, everything yeah. has the emotional feel, and, uh. Yeah. So, I, I think we should leave the ending ambiguous in our discussion by not talking about it. So, yeah, let's, yeah. is there any other, like, themes or things you wanted to touch on? So what I will say is, like, I kind of touched on this, that I feel like this is Pixar's most adult movie. Like, a lot of animated movies have very simple plots, like defeat the villain, or, like, honestly, Western movies in general. It's very, this is my goal, and the movie is about reaching it, and then once you reach it, happy ending, everybody's happy. Mm. And, like, this is kind of a movie that... What happens after happy ending? It also reminded me of... I don't know if this is a comparison that anyone else would make, but it reminds me of an Isao Takahata movie, like ah. Studio Ghibli's second director next to Hayao Miyazaki. But like movies like Only Yesterday or Princess Kaguya, which they're about the celebration of the mu- mundane and how there's yeah. like beauty everywhere all around us constantly. And it's not like the grandiose life of the city and achievement and that that makes life worth living it's the small beautiful things and mm, those are some of my favorite movies and this one hit that same note for me love it it's like when they're on the subway and 22 finds the smoothie and she's like it's can you believe it it's half full (laughs) you know it's it's appreciating you know it's optimism it's appreciating life. this is a very this is a very life-affirming movie yeah for sure like (sighs) I needed this message in the year of our Lord 2020. Yeah. yeah. Like, I have a very on and on, on and off uh, relationship with existential dread. So, like, I was kind of like, oh, is this movie going to make me uh, question things? And it did, but it wasn't like a, you know, a dreadful question. It was more like a, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another theory that I have is that, like, 
some of the issues that I had with the movie are similar to the ones that I had with Inside Out, but I think it's because of how I was understanding, like, the literal visual metaphor. Like, in Inside Out, if you think of it as the emotions are controlling Riley, the movie has problems. Similar to this, like, if you view this spark is the literal thing that literally defines everyone's personalities and it's predetermined, that's where my problems came in. But I kind of like the theory that... This is Joe's view of the great before and the afterlife. So he might possibly be imprinting his own expectations on it. So he views it as people have the one spark that will make them happy and give them purpose. But like then the barbershop scene subverts that and a lot of it subverts it. So that's kind of how I like looking at it. And again, that's one of the things that this movie being open to interpretation. I think it definitely alludes to that like early on when he meets the Jerry's and the Jerry tells him like, I've just taken a form that you that you can comprehend, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that uh, I had a thought that like one of the Jerry straight up says like a spark isn't your purpose. It's just what you need to go to Earth finally. Yeah, they don't really... They don't really get too into what it really is, but it's not your purpose. Yeah, they chuckle and they're like, oh, you humans and your purpose. Because like the barber, he didn't want to be a barber. He wanted to be a veterinarian, but he isn't dissatisfied being a barber. He likes doing it. He likes talking to people and cutting their hair. Yeah. He's saving lives. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So good. We're we're coming up on like two hours of recording, so we should probably kind of wrap it up. With the fact that there was a post credit scene ref- referencing a theater audience, oops. <laughs> That's unfortunate. But it, once you do the gag, it stays in the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this movie was finished during, uh, during COVID lockdown. So this was like animators collaborating in between houses to finish it. Wasn't yeah. this due in like July? Yeah. 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 They they delayed it and delayed it. Like I think they were hoping, they hoping, were hoping. but I everybody think they, was hoping. I think they did the right thing in the end. Do you know how many times they've delayed the freaking James Bond movie? Yeah. <laughs> it's been delayed again. Anyway, yeah, yeah. it is I a mean, bummer. You can't delay it forever. Like this yeah. movie is so visually cool that I wish I could have seen it in theaters. Like this movie, after so many years of Pixar almost feeling like they've kind of lost their spark, this was a return to form to them. For me where they're trying so many new things and seeing how far they can push it with visual style and theme and tone like this reminds me of 2008 to two th- like 2007 2008 pixar where it just felt like anything was possible after ratatouille and wally after remy the ratatouille remy the ratatouille <laughs> remind Is me to animated? remind me to watch that <laughs> i don't know if he can it was only it was only i'm sure thing. it's online somewhere i mean illegally no. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right i think we should wrap it up um so do we recommend this movie yes absolutely 1000 percent. yes this is probably one of my favorite pixar movies have we watched a movie that we don't recommend yet <laughs> i oh can we watch like something bad we were yeah. pretty yeah. negative the on one? the lion king 2019 <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah 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 i feel like i was more lukewarm to it when it came out <laughs> It didn't age well, and it's, it's been a yeah, year. Yeah, it's been, it's been, like, deteriorating in my mind since. Yeah. Um, let's watch Mars Needs Moms. I like Dumbo. Okay, yeah, we do need to do, <laughs> we've been saying we should do an episode on Mars Needs Moms for a while. I do think that's one. We cool. Should. We were kind of split it. on Dumbo. Like, you liked it more than I did. I still haven't yeah. seen it. I just liked it because Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is not the Danny DeVito fan cast. This is Destination Animation. Thank you for listening, folks. Um, check out Soul on Disney Plus if, and uh, I don't know. Check out your stuff too. Oh yeah, my Sell stuff. yourself. Sell, Sell yourself. yourself. Um, so I'm uh, Becca Knott. You can find my artwork and animations and such at my Twitter at BexDK, which is B-E-X-D-E-E-K-A-Y. Uh, uh, me next oh, or Carrie? <laughs> uh, that's right. I was next in the lineup. My bad. Yeah, you um, do. You do. <laughs> and I am Carrie Dreblo. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at Cheetah King two forty three, which I actually do have a new video scheduled to come out as soon as I get the time to edit it. And animation critic, all one word. Hopefully, I'll get back to that eventually. <laughs> uh, and I am uh, Jason Knott. You can find. Uh, I did a review of Soul like literally last night, <laughs> so it's on whatever whatever reviews on Blogger dot com. And I have a YouTube channel, Film Freak on YouTube. I don't have a video on Soul planned, but uh, I have other stuff. So, yes, he's producing consistent content now. Yeah. Aha. And that does it for us. 
Uh, thanks what to- What are you uh, still doing here? Get out of here. <laughs> the family's <laughs> over. Yes, but thanks, thanks to, uh, what does he go by now? Uh, thanks to Mitch St. Jude and Saturn Heights for the theme song. There you go. And check him out on SoundCloud. Is it SoundCloud that he's on? I don't know. <laughs> we, we'll link his stuff in the description. Whatever. He did new cool music for us. Yeah. He did. And with that in mind, Mitch, play us out. No, that's the new, that's the old theme. We're, this is the new theme now. This is 2021. We're leaving things behind. <laughs> Including movie theaters. No! <laughs> Pits aren't bruised at all, but like. Well, that's not an armpit. Well, my elbow pit. That's a weenus. My inner weenus <laughs> is not <laughs> bruised at all. Is that an actual Jason, term? This... Well, the, yeah, it is. The weenus is like the loose skin on your. Oh no, never mind. <laughs> on your elbow, it's the like. The... That, it's not the it, inner elbow. No, that's that, the that, inner... doesn't, that doesn't have a term, does it? That's the inner. It's just no, the no inner it does elbow. have. It does have a term. Steven Universe made a joke about it. Pearl was telling Steven he's got to sneeze into that, and she called it, like, the medical term, and he didn't know what she said, so then she was like, this part, and she was pointing to it. Oh. I remember. Well. I remember everything Pearl ever said. The cubital fossa, is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Whatever. I just call it the inner weenus. <laughs> I don't know if weenus is real, except that I've heard it from multiple sources. Weenus. Weenus. It's a funny word, so whatever. Head head canon accepted. But yeah, an actual Star Wars holiday special, not uh, Life Day. (laughs) That, I love that movie because when you get down to brass tacks, Star Wars is stupid. And even the greatest Star Wars movie is no better than than the Christmas special. (laughs) That's my hot take. Well, I think Star Um, Wars jumped the shark in the early 2000s. They made it ridiculous. Star Wars is supposed to be a serious piece of film. Uh, Star Wars Holiday Special came out in 1977 or 8, right after the original. 78, yeah. Yeah, my hot take is Star Wars has been stupid since 1977. (laughs) That's my, but I love, I mean, I love Star Wars. But we are not a Star Wars podcast. Okay, okay. So I'm just scrolling down the- Sorry, uh, I just had to this. spill some hot tea there. It's pretty hot. It's the tea. Um. Before you say another word. No, oh, sorry. I started going lame, Miz. I'm sorry. <laughs> Except I did the wrong voice. I'm, I'm sure there. Yes, that. That's what I was trying to do. Do not forget my name. <laughs> this I swear by the stars. Do not forget me. Mm-hmm. Carrie Drablo. <laughs> uh, Jason's just gonna let Dragon in. Okay. I'm gonna just let you do that. Just do it so the mic doesn't pick up a bunch of noise. Do it, cowards. Oh, little baby boy. He's so affectionate. Hey, baby. He doesn't like to be apart from us. He's a COVID baby. No. Gigi's sitting on um, my lap now, by the way. Oh. I wonder if the microphone's actually going to pick up his purrs. Oh, it might. I don't know. I've tried to pick up Gigi's purrs on the microphones before, but it doesn't really do it very well. I don't know why. Can you can you hear him purring, Carrie? Don't touch the microphone. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like I, I just think about culture the culture is water really where mean to him. cats in general. It, like, it's true. Yeah, yeah, it stereotypes them as, like, selfish, maniacal bastards, but no, they're cuddly and And let's and not sweet. even mention and what I Tom Hooper a, did. I have a purring kitty on my lap right now, and she's precious and my little d- dumpling. We we are cat people on this podcast. Yeah, definitely. Um, I like dogs, too, though. Yeah, well, we don't have dogs. We have yeah. cats. <laughs> well, I don't know. Between... Jason still has dogs, technically. Well... Technically. Uh, between your three podcast host listeners, we have like twice the amount of cats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a... How dare you drop a thing? No. 
I, I, I put this plush toy here for me to play with instead of the lab thing. So. Well, yeah, I've been playing with stuff, too. Anyway. I gotta pee. <laughs> That's going in now. <laughs> me too, but I'm not saying it because I don't want to be in the bloopers. Too late. <laughs>